Manual Transmission The Basic Function and Working Operational First of all I would like to introduce the main component. We have the main housing. This housing will protect all the internal components and hold them in place. Looking inside we have the input shaft, the output shaft and a counter shaft. A number of gears are fixed to the counter shaft. These will therefore all rotate together. On the input shaft we also have a gear which is in constant mesh with the counter shaft. The gear teeth are at an angle, which is known as a helical cut. These gear teeth gradually engage on multiple teeth, from one side to the other. This distributes the stress on the gears and makes the gear mesh much quieter than a straight cut spur gear. At the other end of the input shaft is the clutch. This will connect to the engine and force the input shaft to rotate. Anytime the clutch is engaged with the engine it causes the input and counter shaft to rotate. There are also a number of different sized gears on the output shaft. These are also in constant mesh with the gears on the counter shaft. And so when the counter shaft rotates so will the output gears. However, Notice that the output shaft does not rotate with the output gears. That's because each output gear sits on a needle bearing. This allows the gear to rotate independently from the shaft. If we look at the output shaft we see there are a number of spline sections. These are grooves which are cut into the metal. A synchronizer hub fits over the splines. The splines will lock the hub in place so that it will rotate with the shaft. Another component called a synchronizer sleeve will fit over the hub. The outer surface of the hub and the inner surface of the sleeve are both splined. This interlocks the two components. The sleeve can move forwards and backwards on the hub. When the output shaft rotates so will the hub and the sleeve, but not the output gears. Attached to the channel on the outside of each of the sleeves is a shift fork and a shift rod. The rod connects to the gear shifter. The gear shifter moves the rod backwards and forwards, which therefore also moves the fork and sleeve backwards and forwards. On each of the output gears we find some additional straight cut teeth. These teeth will align with the spline teeth inside the sleeve. When the gear is selected the teeth inside the sleeve align and interlock with the straight cut teeth on the gear. The gear will now be interlocked with the sleeve and the output shaft. So when the input shaft rotates this rotates the counter shaft which rotates the output gear. And this now rotates the output shaft. When the gear is disengaged the sleeve returns to its default position, allowing the output gear and the sleeve to rotate independently from each other. The problem we face is that the output shaft and the sleeve are rotating at different speeds to the output gear. So when we engage the sleeve the teeth are going to collide and grind. To overcome this we use a synchronizer blocker ring. It's called this because it will prevent or block the gear from changing until the sleeve and the gear speed are synchronized. The inner edge of the blocker ring is angled and matches the cone on the gear. This allows the blocker ring to easily slide on and off of the gear. We also have some small struts which are inserted into the slots of the hub. These are held in place by a radial spring which pushes them outwards. The sleeve sits over the struts and the hub. A ridge on top of the strut interlocks with the sleeve. The sleeve will move the struts back and forth. There are also some slots cut into the blocker ring. These will align with the struts. The slots are wider than the strut which allows the blocker ring to rock back and forth a small amount. The blocker ring rotates with the hub and the sleeve. When a gear is selected the sleeve moves towards the gear. This pushes the strut against the blocker ring. The blocker ring rubs against the cone of the gear, causing the blocker ring to rotate until it hits the limit of the slot. The blocker ring's teeth and the sleeve teeth are now out of alignment. This prevents the sleeve from engaging with the gear. As the blocker ring continues to be pushed against the gear cone, the friction generated between the two causes them to synchronize speed and rotate together. The sleeve is then pushed across, moving the blocker ring and allowing the teeth on the sleeve to engage with the straight teeth of the gear.
the gear is now synchronized and the clutch can be engaged. To reverse the car we need to bring the car to a complete stop. An idler gear is then pushed into position with both the output and the counter gear. All three gears are straight cut, which is also known as a spur gear. The idler gear is free to rotate. This allows it to slide into position when the car has stopped. Now the output shaft will rotate in the opposite direction. The engine is going to provide the rotational energy. If we engage the clutch with the car in neutral, the input shaft rotates, causing the counter shaft and the output gears to rotate. The output shaft does not rotate though. For first gear we disengage the clutch, which stops the engine from adding any further power to the input shaft. Then we push the gear stick so that it moves the sleeve. The blocker ring rubs against the gear hub and uses the friction to synchronize the speed. Once synchronized the sleeve moves across to interlock the gear to the output shaft. For second gear we disengage the clutch and use the gear shifter to disengage the first gear sleeve. Then we move the shifter into the second gear, which pushes the sleeve and blocker ring. This synchronizes the speed and interlocks the second gear. For third gear we disengage the clutch and use the gear shifter to disengage the second gear sleeve. Then we move the shifter into the third gear, which pushes the sleeve and blocker ring. This synchronizes the speed and interlocks the third gear. For fourth gear we disengage the clutch and use the gear shifter to disengage the third gear sleeve. Then we move the shifter into the fourth gear, which pushes the sleeve and the blocker ring. This synchronizes the speed and interlocks the fourth gear. For fifth gear we disengage the clutch and use the gear shifter to disengage the fourth gear sleeve. Then we move the shifter into the fifth gear, which pushes the sleeve and blocker ring. This synchronizes the speed and interlocks the fifth gear. For reverse we bring the car to a complete stop and disengage the clutch. All of the shafts and the gears come to a stop. We then slide the idler spur gear between the counter and the output gears. Then we re-engage the clutch to reverse the direction of the output shaft. The gears. Each speed has an output speed. The speed gears in this constant mesh transmission are always linked. They have diagonal or helical cut teeth for quieter operation. Notice the reverse gear set with its straight teeth. This transmission will make a familiar gear whining sound when in reverse. The power flows through the main shaft to the counter shaft to the differential assembly. And out through front axles, synchronizing gears. To make gear shifting possible, one gear in each set floats freely on its shaft riding on a roller bearing. The other gear in each set is either connected with splines or directly machined into its respective shaft. For power output, the floating gear in each set must become securely connected to the shaft through the synchronization process. Between each gear set, there's a synchronizer hub that splines to and rotates with the shaft. A sliding shift sleeve is also driven by this hub, which can be moved back and forth by a selector fork. Forks are connected to sliding rods that are held by the external casing. During gear selection, the fork moves the sleeve towards the desired gear. A blocker ring sits between the sleeve and the gear. The blocker ring's job is to get everything spinning at the same speed and lined up for a synchronization attempt, or block further movement if synchronization isn't possible for whatever reason. The hub has slots for three synchronizer keys that spin the blocker ring, but allow enough play so the blocker ring can adjust on the fly as the sleeve teeth approach. The shift sleeve's internal teeth are shaped to push against the keys, which in turn press the blocker ring against the gear. The ring's inside surface is conical and has ridges to engage the cone-shaped gear surface like a miniature clutch.
Gradually, the gear begins to spin with the blocker ring. The keys are spring-loaded. Once enough pressing force builds, the keys are no longer needed and move down and out of the way, allowing the sleeve to progress into its final synchronized position with gear locking teeth. This process enables fast gear selection between rotating components while keeping main gear teeth safe from the change procedure. Locking teeth on the sleeve and gear are slightly angled in some designs, encouraging a more secure connection. Now, power flows through the spline hub and sleeve through the gear set and out of the transmission.to switch gears, the clutch is pressed in, pressure is relieved, and the sleeve can slide into synchronization with an adjacent floating gear. Since each sleeve can only slide between adjacent gears, for this six-speed transmission, there are three selector forks and rods. Now, power flows through the spline hub and sleeve through the gear set and out of the transmission.to switch gears, the clutch is pressed in, pressure is relieved, and the sleeve can slide into synchronization with an adjacent floating gear. Since each sleeve can only slide between adjacent gears, for this six-speed transmission, there are three selector forks and rods. The first and second floating gears operate from the output shaft, but this doesn't fundamentally change functionality in any way. Forks and rods only move back and forth, as directed by the shift change assembly. This component can swing side to side to select a specific rod and fork, and once selected, a metal tab pushes the fork one way or the other. Let's trace this component's movement from the shift lever itself. The shift lever rides on a ball that allows movement on two axes. Each movement axis is separated into its own cable. These work something like bicycle brake cables to translate stick movement to the transmission. At the other end, cables are attached to a rod that protrudes out of the transmission case. This rod can move up and down or rotate based on distinct cable input. A specially designed piece at the other end of this rod moves connected components to swing side to side or slide the metal tab back and forth. Reverse gear position. The reverse gear has its own rod and selector fork, the transmission must come to a complete stop to shift into reverse as there are no synchronization components. Adding the third idler gear to the system reverses final output. Neutral position. When in the neutral position with no gear selected and the clutch engaged, meaning the clutch pedal is not pressed in, the transmission input shaft spins, but since no gear is synchronized, no power flows out of the transmission. Oil lubrication. Oil rests at the bottom of the case and is splashed up onto gears for lubrication. There's no oil pump or filter in this manual transmission what we had discussed. Like, share, and subscribe to our channel for more exciting content about the world of vehicle equipment. Thank you for watching and your support.